Hello and welcome to Grace Online. I'm so glad that you decided to join us this morning. My name is Jillian and I'm the Connections Coordinator at our Ann Arbor location. You know, one thing that I love about my job is the opportunity to help people take a next step. I always say that everyone has a next step, whether you've been coming to Grace for years and years or this is your first time. You could join a community group or get plugged into serving on a ministry team or even share a prayer request. Whatever that next step might look like for you, I invite you to go to our app and fill out our connection card. While you're there, you can also go ahead and give right through the app or you can text any amount to 84321 or give online at gracechurch.city slash give. Now let's go ahead and take a deep breath and prepare our hearts as we hear today's message. Well, good morning and welcome to Grace. My name is Zach Stamp. I'm the pastor at our uh, Canton location, and I'm just thrilled to be able to share with you what God has been laying on my heart. Now, a couple weeks ago, I returned home from my annual trip to the mountains of Wyoming. And one of the things I love about that area is how wild it is. It is beautiful, yet at the same time, it is unpredictable. It is accessible, yet at the same time, it is untamed. At any moment, you can get caught up in a horrific thunderstorm or flash flood. You can even trip, fall, and break a leg. At any moment, you can even stumble upon a wild animal. And when I say wild animals, I mean wild animals, right? Like these are not the tame, domesticated versions that you see at a zoo, right? These are fierce warriors who must fight for their very survival. It's, it's dangerous. It's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. It's a truly wild place. Well, over the years, I've learned that you can marvel at the untamed beauty and glory of the wild, but you must always respect it. In the moment that you don't respect the wild, it can have devastating effects on your life. In fact, it can even take your life. For example, a number of years ago, uh, we were on our way to one of my favorite fishing spots when we uh, sort of spotted, I don't know, maybe five or six cars parked on the side of the road, which usually means that someone has spotted a wild animal. And in this case, there were three bull moose on the side of the road. Now, for the record, I don't know if there's a more majestic animal in the wild than a bull moose. They are huge, massive creatures. I mean, think like a Clydesdale horse on steroids. Like they are huge. Their hooves are like the size of, of a soccer ball. And they're so powerful that I've even seen them run through a four foot deep, muddy beaver pond like it's dry ground. Like these are majestic, amazing animals animals, but they are also extremely dangerous. In fact, there are, are more human deaths every year due to moose attacks than bear attacks. So here we are, we're approaching this crowd and we saw everybody get out of, of their cars and they began taking pictures of the moose as they absolutely should. But I noticed that with every minute that passed by, people were inching closer and closer and closer to the moose. And there was one man in spe um, specifically that uh, wanted a picture of his kids with the moose. And it looked like he was actually moving to put the kids on the back of the moose. So at that point, I quickly intervened. And, and thankfully, the, the parents took my advice and they backed off and, and my belief actually saved the kids' lives. Now, in that moment, I don't think that the parents liked me very much, but they didn't really be understand what the problem was, right? However, a few minutes later, they would. See, something spooked the moose and, and they quickly rose to their feet and, and they ran away. And listen to me, when they did, the earth shook. Trees were knocked over, six foot tall bushes were uprooted, and the crowd that had gathered was in shock and awe of the raw power. And when I got back into the car, my daughter turns to me and asks me, she says, Daddy, why would those people be so silly as to approach a wild moose. And I explained to her that they believed that the moose was something that it was not. They thought of it more like a, a, a stuffed animal than a wild animal. And their belief, no matter how misguided, drove their behavior. See, what you believe determines how you act. In other words, belief drives behavior. 
If you believe that a medicine will help you, what do you do? You, you take it. If you believe that someone loves you, what do you do? You, you probably end up marrying them. If you believe that something's going to hurt you, what do you do? You avoid it. And if you believe that a moose is a teddy bear, you put your kid on it. See, what you believe determines how you act. Therefore, don't miss this. Therefore, what you believe is critical because it will ultimately shape your behavior. And hear me on this, misguided beliefs can have devastating effects upon your soul and upon your life. Sort of like a man putting his kid on the back of a moose. And in the same way, we must understand that what you believe about God will shape the way you view Him and the way you live for Him. Let me say that again. What you believe about God will shape the way you view Him in the way you will live for Him. And the reverse is also true. Our misguided beliefs about God can have devastating effects upon our soul and even upon our lives. Well, throughout church history, one of the most discussed and debated the beliefs of, about God has revolved around the person of the Holy Spirit, right? Who's the Spirit? What's the Spirit all about? Uh, what's the Spirit do? Can we even know the Spirit? Has the Spirit been quenched? Well, today we are beginning a four-week series that's going to explore the person, the power, the presence, and the prompting. That's four Ps, of course, right? Of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer for each of us is, is that we would gain a greater understanding of the Holy Spirit because that belief will drive our behavior and it will radically shape the way that we view God and the way that we live for Him. So today I want to kick off this series by exploring the person of the Holy Spirit. And to do that, I want to start in Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, we see in Genesis that in the beginning, God, God alone was by himself and he created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in it, right? In fact, he spoke it into existence and boom, there it is. And at the very beginning of this story, at the Genesis of Genesis, if you may, look at what God says in verse 26. God said, let us make man, human beings, in our image, according to our likeness. Let us make human beings in our image. Listen, I thought God was alone at creation. I thought he alone was original. So what is this us? Who is this we that he's talking about? Well, what we see throughout the rest of the Bible, throughout the rest of Scripture, is that the us, that the we, that the hour of Genesis, is actually what's known as the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? See, God is a triune God, one God, not three, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, let's be a little honest, that can be extremely confusing. In fact, throughout history, people have proposed many different um, called metaphors to help us understand the relationship of the Trinity. In fact, most famously, people have used uh, different properties of water to describe the relationship of the Trinity, right? You've, you've, you've got water in the form of liquid, ice, and steam, right? One substance, three different forms. Others have used human beings to describe the re relationship of the Trinity. After all, we were made in the image of God, right? For example, I am one person. I am Zach. But simultaneously, I'm a father to my kids, a son to my parents, and a husband to my wife. Now, these metaphors can be helpful, but at the same time, we have to understand that they fall dreadfully short of explaining the complexities of the Trinity because it ultimately reduces a divine and holy God to a simple analogy. Now, for many people, the complexities of the Trinity is a deal breaker, right? They say, if I can't understand it, I cannot believe it, which I find to be a really silly thought and argument because there's lots of things we, we, we see in every day that we don't understand, yet we believe in and we utilize. For example, cars. Very few people have a clue at how cars work, but yet they, they use them. Same thing with cell phones, same thing with computers, right? We don't know how it works, but we use it every single day. Now, for me personally, I'm okay not being able to fully explain the Trinity. In fact, I'm kind of glad that I can't. 
See, my um, feeble, small, tiny brain, if, if my feeble, small, tiny brain can fully comprehend the complexities of, div of a divine, holy God of all creation, then listen to me, God is way too small. The fact that my human mind can't fully comprehend the complexity of God is actually comforting to me. In fact, in Deuteronomy 29, uh, it tells us that God is huge, that he's, he's mysterious, and his ways are beyond our comprehension. In fact, all we know, it says, is what's been revealed to us by God in Scripture. And Scripture reveals to us, listen to me, a Trinitarian God. One God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each of them are equally divine. So don't miss this. This means that the Father, that the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all God. It's one God, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipotent, all-powerful, omnipresent. They're everywhere, right? So it's not that the Father and the Son or, or Jesus are these things and the Spirit's not. No, all of them are. God is a triune God, one God, three persons equally divine. And see, you have to understand that, that for many Christians, the Holy Spirit can easily become, as Francis Chan once said, a forgotten God, right? We, we, we can sort of emphasize two parts of the Trinity, the Father and, the G, and, and Jesus, while neglecting the Holy Spirit altogether. But hear me on this, picking and choosing what you're going to like or dislike, what you're going to worship or not worship about God is not only wrong, but it's dangerous. In fact, throughout the Bible and human history where we've seen this occur, we've seen physical, emotional, and spiritual chaos unfold. See, God is not some buffet or smorgasbord where you just pick and choose what you want from Him. No, He is the divine triune God of all creation in whom we worship and in whom we surrender, whether we fully understand or not. And what we see is that God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Check out what the Gospel of John uh, says about the Trinity. John chapter 14, picking it up in verse 16. This is actually Jesus speaking. Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now notice here that Jesus tells his disciples that he's, he's leaving them soon. He's going to ascend to the Father, but God is going to give them this, this helper, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't describe the Spirit as a what, right? But rather, He describes the Spirit as a who, as a person. So do not miss this. Jesus is telling them, and He's telling us about the person of the Holy Spirit, a person who will walk with them, who will be with them, who will help them, teach them, speak to them, abide with them. In other words, what we see is that our relationship with God is felt and realized in and through the person of the Holy Spirit. The Father ordains it. The Son, Jesus, secured it. And yet we experience it in and through the Holy Spirit. This means that when you feel that tug on your heart, when you're listening to a, a sermon or a podcast, or maybe you're reading a book, listen, that's the Spirit, the Holy Spirit working in you. That when you feel a sense of conviction or, or exhortation or even encouragement, listen, that's the person of the Holy Spirit. That when you experience the peace, the, the grace, the, the love of God, that's the work of the Spirit in you because the person of the Spirit explains, illuminates, reveals, and speaks to us, right? So do not miss this. God, the Holy Spirit, is someone to be loved someone to walk with, someone to listen to, and someone to obey. And tragically, we over the years have, have misunderstood this. And instead of seeing the Spirit as a person to be loved, we see the Spirit as a mere power to be harnessed to accomplish our purposes. If you may, He sort of becomes this spiritual five-hour energy, right? This sort of helps us get through our day and accomplish our goals. Listen, if, if this is the way you view the Holy Spirit, you will always see God as a means to accomplish your goals rather than the goal itself. You'll see him sort of as the proverbial genie in the bottle, right? Just give him a rub and he'll give you anything you ask for rather than being the object of your affections and your worship. 
And sadly, for many of us, we have been behaving and maybe even living as if the Holy Spirit is a mere force to be harnessed rather than a person to be loved, followed, and obeyed. Notice what else John said, or actually Jesus says about the Spirit in John chapter 14. Let me reread verse 17. He says, but you know him. This is talking about the Spirit. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. In fact, uh, later on in Romans chapter 5, Paul says that, that, that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is in us. In his letter to the Corinthian church, he says, uh, this is Paul, he says, you are a, a temple of the Holy Spirit in which the Holy Spirit dwells, right? So don't miss this. What all of those are saying is that the Spirit lives within you. That when we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, that the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And at that point, our bodies, as Paul says, becomes a sanctuary in which the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the person the Spirit dwells. So take a second and sort of pause and consider that. In Christ, you become a temple. You become a sanctuary by which the Spirit, the person of God, dwells in you. He's not distant. He is near. He's not there to, to shame you but to deliver you from shame. He's not there to disengage, but rather to transform you, to shape you, to mold you, to redeem you, to do His greatest work in you and through you. Because the presence of the person of the Spirit changes everything, everything. In fact, the disciples are a great example of this, right? In fact, just after Jesus' death and resurrection, you have to understand that the disciples were not bold and powerful. If anything, they were weak and timid, right? I mean, after all, Peter denied Jesus three times. Judas betrayed Jesus, and the other disciples are, are cowering in fear, hiding out in a house, hoping to not be found. And then suddenly, Jesus appears to them. And yet still, they're not out boldly proclaiming the gospel. In fact, uh, the Bible says that some of them still had doubts. But then it happened. Look at what Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4 says. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. See, the Holy Spirit at that moment was poured out upon them and in them. And following that singular moment, everything changed for the disciples. Uncertainty was transformed into certainty. Fear was replaced by confidence. And questions were replaced by conviction. And the disciples at that moment boldly and powerfully began to change lives through the preaching of the gospel. And let me be very clear, the disciples didn't change their lives. It was the Holy Spirit who did it through them. That they're just a bunch of broken clay pots. But when those broken vessels are, are filled with the Holy Spirit, everything changed. And listen to me, if you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. That same Spirit... That same Spirit that transformed sinners into saints and fishermen into disciples, that same Spirit that transformed lives and families and cultures and countries, that same Spirit is in you. That when you ask God to forgive you of your sin through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, at that very moment, the person of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon you and within you. In fact, I love the imagery of this, right? It's, it's that of, of water overflowing and saturating you. So it's not that you get a taste or, or a hint of the Spirit, but that it's lavished upon you completely. It soaks you, if you may. So take a moment and, and let that sink in deep. Let that, if you may, marinate and soak in that God, the person of the Holy Spirit, lives in you. That He knows what you think and He knows what you feel. He celebrates with you in the midst of the good, the bad, and the ugly. He, he knows what you celebrate and He knows what you struggle with. He knows the depths of your dreams and, as well as the things that no one else knows. <laughs> And He's committed to you, to, to shape you and to form you 
and to help you understand. Listen, he's not absent or distant. He is near in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the question we have to ask is this, is do you believe it? Do you believe that truth? Because just imagine how that truth, how that belief might radically reshape your behavior, your faith, and your life as a whole. I mean, how might that affect the way you pray? How might that affect the way you you process through difficulty and loss? How might that affect your your decision-making process? Listen, it would change everything, right? Now, I'm not sure about you, but, but, but for me, this is incredibly convicting because if I'm honest, my view and my understanding and dependence upon the person of the Holy Spirit is way too small. Because let's face it, it's incredibly easy to ignore the Spirit altogether. And tragically, this happens all over Christianity and maybe even in many of our lives today. Our beliefs are incorrect or maybe at best lopsided, and that deeply affects our behavior. It affects the way we view God and it affects the way we ultimately follow Him. So my prayer for, for, for you and for myself is that God would, would elevate our personal understanding and awareness of the person of the Holy Spirit. If you may, I pray that the Holy Spirit would, would flood over us and saturate us with an overwhelming awareness of His presence. I pray that His his awareness would would shape our belief and that that belief would radically reshape the way we view God, the way we follow Him, both individually and collectively as a church. So I pray that we would become a people who thirst for the presence of the person of the Holy Spirit of which nothing compares. I pray that we would become a people who cry out to the Spirit, that His grace and peace and mercy and love would be felt and made manifest in our lives. I pray that we would be a people who are sensitized to the awareness and the nearness of God, that we would expect Him to speak and to heal and to move in such a way that we would know and experience more of the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm not quite sure what your Spirit is doing in each of us this morning. Maybe for some of us, we're feeling a sense of of conviction. Maybe for others of us, we're, we're hearing your sweet whispers of grace. Still, maybe even for others of us, we might need a fresh outpouring, an overflow of your confidence, your peace, your mercy, and your love. Father, wherever each of us are at, may we take this time and cry out to your Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you fill us? Would you refresh us? Would you be present with us? Would you ultimately change us? Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to feel your presence. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today online. I really hope you found today's message to be meaningful and that there's a takeaway that you can bring into the week with you. Next week, I invite you to join us in person at any of our three locations. But if you're not able to make it in person, we'll see you right back here online at 9 or 10 a.m. And until then, go and be the church.